and the natural world lends itself to her incredible skill of sharing her knowledge with teaching, writing, public speaking, and garden consulting. Deb has also served on various local and national committees and boards that focus on education, the environment, and sustainability. She held a two-year term as honorary president of the Herb Society of America and is currently the chair of the Sustainability Committee of GardenCom. In addition, she mentored the future of the landscape industry at Columbus State Community College for 24 years. So I encourage you after this talk to check out the wonderful books that Deb has penned, which are really great resources, especially as you can see to those of us that are here in Ohio and the Midwest. In fact, I think we already mentioned it, but just in case you didn't hear, she does have a handout on our website where you registered for this course, along with a list of all of these books. For the next hour though, we're all learning directly from Deb about what she calls eco-conscious gardening. And just as a reminder, you're welcome to put your questions or give a thumbs up to other people's questions in the Q&A box, just like Denise mentioned. So thank you all very much to all of you who are joining us today from across the country. And thank you, Deb, for getting us all ready for spring this winter morning. Thank you, Julia. Um, I'm going to pretty much go right into the screen share, but I do want to mention that the handout that's on the website uh, is my text slides. Some of the text slides are heavy, lots of words. And nowadays they say you shouldn't do that anymore because people can't see it on the screen, especially if you're using a, a tablet or a phone. But uh, there's always the handout and you don't have to print it out. It's yours electronically, but it will help you uh, not to have to write everything down. So with that, going into screen share. Maybe, yes, there we go. <clears throat> okay, so welcome to a talk that is incredibly close to my heart. And this is a journey. Um, Eco-conscious gardening uh, is a journey from trying so many different things in the garden, seeing what works and what doesn't. And today I'll be talking about the concept the concepts that surround eco-conscious gardening and that how they can be realized in design. This is not how to design it. <clears throat> That's a whole different thing. Um, there will be some hints here and there on things that you can do and um, directions you can take, but I'm not going to sit here and say, well, you take these trees and you put three of them over there, et cetera. So I hope you haven't come to this thinking that I was going to teach you in an hour how to design an eco-conscious garden. But instead, I want to inspire you to change your gardens to become more eco-conscious. So what is eco-conscious? It, it is ecology. And ecology is made up of the study of oikos, our home. This planet is our home. So we are conscious of what we do to our home. And what you see here in this picture is the Hula Valley in Israel. And in the 1950s, they drained it. It was, it was Lake Hula, but they drained it because of malaria and also to have places for agriculture. Eventually they realized it was a mistake to drain the whole lake because it was an international flyway for many birds and they had no place to go. So part of the fields were allowed to go back to the hydric system that they were. And now over the course of a year, 500 million birds visit this lake. And this picture is a little <clears throat> dusky, if you will, because I was taking this picture at dusk as we were waiting for the birds to come in for their night rest. And it was truly a spiritual experience. And it helps you understand that we are a part of this world, not apart from it. 
Whoops. So to get a few words out of the way, what is organic, sustainable, regenerative? Organic means it has carbon in it. But in the gardening world, we take it to mean that we will not put synthetic inputs into our gardening systems. We will use organic inputs, natural substances, which can be just as poisonous as something that is synthesized in the lab. Nicotine is a natural substance. It's a biocide. Uh, it works really well, as unfortunately we so well know. So organic doesn't imply safety, although some people think it does. What it means is that you are in the gardening world, that you are using natural ingredients, much like in the kitchen. Sustainable. Sustainable is that what we do today will not harm the ability of future gardeners to garden in the same place. Now I'm sort of paraphrasing that from uh, the Brunt Convention with the UN as to what sustainable development is, but sustainable means that you are not harming the earth that you are on and that what you do does not decrease the ability of that system to be viable, to be living. It also has another meaning that whatever you create, you are able to sustain. If you create a garden, is it, is it sustainable for you in your budget of time and money, in your strength, uh, your ability to take care of it? So two different ways to look at sustainability. And then regenerative. That is somewhat of a new term, although it's been around for quite a while, but it's breaking out into the public to regenerate to repair, to heal. And this word comes from, um, mostly from healing the soil because our soil systems in the world, many of them have been degraded, compacted, filled with compounds, chemicals, et cetera, that do not help its health. So regeneration is like a step further from sustainability we want to sustain what we have, but in regeneration, we want to make it better. So part of that is understanding what is the carrying capacity? How much can a system take? So as you look at the world, you have to think about that, carrying capacity. And I have to go to the ethics of permaculture, which are guidelines for me in all of my life, but especially so in my gardening life. Care of the earth, care of people, fair share, how much do you really need, and limits aware. And we're becoming more aware of that as our climate is changing and some areas are getting too much water and others are not getting enough, water being one of the well, the most limiting um, resource to health. And, that and the, the term that covers all of that is genius loci, the spirit of place, being aware of the spirit. What is the feeling of this place? What is the life of this place? And what, what is your part in it? So a garden. A garden is an idea, a purpose the reason why you are doing it. It's a place, sun, shade, your backyard, front yard, community garden, etc. It's the where. And then it's an action, active and passive. It's the what. So here we look at the why, the where, and the what. And the how is another talk. So gardens that have purpose. Gardens, your garden purpose, your, your idea, your overall idea drives your garden design. Do you want formal classic design? Do you want wildlife gardens? How about food gardens? That's hot now, food gardens. Do you want herb gardens? Is your garden one of personal expression? Are you a garden railroad enthusiast or do you love art of every kind in your garden? And then there's cultural expression. What is your background? Who are your forefathers? Is there a design concept that draws you that um, you, you need 
in your garden. Then there are gardens of healing. This is the Cancer Survivors Plaza on Ohio State's campus, part of Chava Barbaritum. Stormwater control, do you have too much water? Is it going in the wrong place? And finally, gardens of faith, Mary gardens, um, saints gardens, and in this case, um, this is in Bernheim Forest in Kentucky, and the name of the statue is Let There Be Light. And what we do, the actions in our garden, we teach, we grow food, we make compost, we repair. The Sharon Meadows Constructed Wetland is a project I worked on with a whole group of people. Uh, it, it's a talk in and of itself on how we changed a muddy, sloppy space into a constructed wetland. And if you're interested in learning more, please go to my website. I have a video about it. And then, of course, we use our gardens to relieve stress, to go and to leave the cares of the world behind. And I'll tell you, this past year, the garden has been a very important place for me and for many others that I know. And lastly, well, not really lastly, but another so important aspect of gardening, the what we do is to support the others that come to our garden, our native bumblebees and our monarchs need our support because we've changed their environments. So a garden is an idea, a place and an action, but it is also an ecology. It is a habitat for many, many organisms. And the difference between ecosystem and habitat. Habitat is where something lives and an ecosystem is this. It is the abiotic and biotic components of a system. And I'll show you more about that in just a moment. <clears throat> But here we have water and wetlands. We have the Oregon coast. We have cedar bog, which is really a fen in our Urbana, Ohio on the upper right. And we have one of the rivers that go through the Highlands Nature Sanctuary in the Ark of Appalachia. We have drylands, upland and lowland. In the upper left, we have Goliath Peak on Mount, um, on Mount Evans way out in Colorado. Uh, the first time I was there, it was like uh, a thunderbolt hit. Fortunately, not a real one because that can happen on a mountain. But I stood there and said, I want this. I want this. Uh, so this is 11,000 feet up in the air and my garden's at 842 feet above sea level. And I tried to do this and I had to modify it a bit. On the lower right is the in 2004 is Mount St. Helens, the regeneration of that landscape. And you can still see the stumps of the trees that were blown over by the blast. And then on the right is Joshua Tree National Forest. And that tree, which is actually a monocot, so not a true tree as we think of them, but that tree is related to the Dracaena that you grow as a house plant. We have forest and prairie, upper left, again, the uh, Ark of Appalachia in Ohio. And the upper right are the oak openings in Northwest Ohio. The prairies, Kamama Prairie with Indian paintbrush and prairie dock in the spring, again, in the Ark of Appalachia. And then on the lower right is a reconstructed wetland at the Battelle Darby um, Metro Park. And it was a wetland that was drained and turned into a farm that became a wetland again through the work of many, many volunteers and staff of Metro Parks. And then we go and we look at what happens when an invasive plant invades. Winter creeper euonymus shouldn't be planted. I'm not even sure the cultivar should be planted because if they revert, this is what they do. If you decide to plant it, you have to be vigilant and make sure that you take out any sports that come up that are the, the green that you see covering the floor at John Bryant State Park, Clifton Gorge. Oh, by the way, just to go back to that moment, in ecology, we talk about uh, a concept of climax forest and 
that's not used as much anymore because we know that <clears throat> the ecology is ever changing. But when a and when an invasive plant comes into a system, we call it a disclimax. Think about that term, a disclimax. This concept is not new, ecology in the garden, where our plants come from, understanding what happens in the systems of our gardens. In 1895, William Robinson, I'm sure Rick Dark may talk about the book that uh, he put out, um, reworking of the wild garden. Are ferns in their haunts? Where do ferns grow and how do we make them grow in our gardens? And then one of my most favorite books, a real eye opener for me in 1993, Noah's Garden by Sarah Stein, who is no longer with us. She, um, and then planting Noah's Garden. She really was one of my muses that made me change significantly my path in the garden. So when we look at when we look at ecology and when we look at the, the players in our gardens, if you will, we have living and we have non-living. The living or biotic are our plants, our animals, and the micro and macro organisms that live in our soil. They, we all share it. And again, I want to say that we are a part of nature, not apart from it. There is a concept called biophilia, the love of nature, the, the essential need of ours to be in nature. And we really discovered that this past year. It was a term coined by E.O. Wilson. <clears throat> Actually, it was coined by someone in the early 1900s and E.O. Wilson brought it back to life but it is our essential need to be in contact with these other players in the landscape and in our gardens. What overlies the, the, the living aspect are the abiotic aspects of our gardens, the environment, weather, the history of the land, pollutants, the carrying capacity, which I already mentioned, water availability, temperature, altitude, and latitude. <clears throat> As you look at this, this group that you see here, you're looking at our ecosystems. Plants are the producers. They make food with some exceptions. There are some that take food from others like mistletoe. Um, and then the animals, we are consumers. We don't make our own food. We are dependent upon the plants and other animals for our food. There's bacteria, fungi, um, and they're part of the whole ecosystem of the world, um, the biosphere, if you will, but we find many, many of them as a complex web in our soil. And there are some who say soil is not alive. Um, I'll grant sand, silt, and clay, nutrients, pH, not alive in the sense that we are, but all of the organisms that are in soil make it a living a living ecosystem and they're the cyclers and without them, we'd have a lot of stuff on this land that we'd be wondering how to get rid of. So here's the soil. And to me, um, if I have a place of worship, it is this, it is the soil, it is the environment. And our soil does a lot for us in terms of services. Although I don't know that we have to justify that soil uh, serves us, but it does in these ways, carbon sequestration, nutrient cycling, filtering and buffering of compounds, habitat for an astounding number of organisms, billions and billions of organisms in a cup of soil, pest and disease control, the foundation of our food systems, and more. So let's circle back to gardens because I took you on a journey of ecology when we talk about gardens, often we say, we look at them from an architectural point of view. It's a narrow plant, it's a weeping plant, it's a spreading plant. It crawls on the ground, it, um, it's a vine, so it weaves. Architectural, how it fits together from an artistic point.
point of view, botanical. It's a perennial, it's an annual, it's woody, it's herbaceous. I love that we say herbaceous perennials. Well, we say perennials and we mean herbaceous perennials, but it's actually, I mean, trees are perennials too. They just are perennials that decided to have a persistent root and a persistent shoot. The uh, definition of a perennial is a plant that makes a persistent shoot and in woody plants, persistent root. And if you don't kill it, lives for more than two years. We have shrubs, we have um, um, subshrubs, funny category that's between woody plants and herbaceous plants. In fact, when we put this framework on plants, it's our framework. A lot of plants don't fit exactly in this framework, but we make them fit because we are categorizers by nature. And there's the aesthetic framework. It's pretty, it's attractive. I like it for whatever reason. And that is the way that we often design our gardens, but I would like to challenge you to look at the bottom of this slide, to look at the plants that are competitors. Um, Jerusalem artichoke, how's that? Or a uh, horsetail, that's a competitor. Social plants or stress tolerator plants, they play nice with other plants. They say, okay, yeah, we'll just kind of fit in here and I won't get in your space, at least not for a while. And then we have our ruderals. Those are what we often call our weeds. They're the plants that come into open ground. They're colonizers. And another book by Sarah Stein is called My Weeds. And after reading that book, I had a healthy respect for weeds. And now I treat them a little bit nicer. I don't want them in my garden beds, but they're allowed to be in other places like my lawn. You'll see that later too. This talks about plant strategies for survival, the adaptations that plants have gone through to survive in this world. What have they done? They've become nitrogen fixers. Those are our colonizers. They're the ones that can live on poor land because they can take nitrogen from the air. There are others that offer pollen and nectar in exchange for, hey, will you uh, pollinate something else so we can make some seeds here? Different root structures to fit into a system and a lelopathy, hey, get out of my way. Otherwise I will poison you with my roots and other plant parts. And when we look at this system of adaptation, there are, these are just two parameters of a garden. There are many parameters of a garden, but they're the two that a lot of people make mistakes with. We have sun and we have shade. Sun plants go in the sun and shade plants go in the shade. And then there's a whole bunch in between that can kind of shift along that continuum. Then we have wet and we have dry. Don't put wet lovers into dry and don't put dry lovers into wet but we do it all the time. These two parameters kind of define our types of places that we have on this earth and that we have in our gardens because we have to make the choice. Do we deal with what we have or do we change it to some grand design that we have in our mind? And as I will talk more about these places, but I did give you a slide of this when I copied it onto the... Um, to the handout, a uh, PowerPoint didn't play well with Word, so it's kind of blurry. So I just gave you the slide. When we look at those types, those places, those wet and dry and sun and shade places, they are habitat. They're woodlands, prairie meadows, wetlands, and they have garden correlates. The types of gardens that we create are actually habitats and if we construct them well, they are good habitats. If we construct them not so well, they're not. And how do you figure out what's a good habitat or how to construct it? You read, you talk to other gardeners, you go to webinars, you go on to good websites on the web, um, universities, um, Oh, there's so many good websites. Just, just be careful. If something sounds too good to be true, it is. But these are just a small subset of books that you can use to look at where plants come from and where they fit in your garden world. 
So let's talk about some of these habitats and how they correlate to your gardens. So in a woodland forest, we have upland drier, bottomland, bottomland wetter, and vernal pools, places where water collects, spring, sometimes autumn, and then disappears in the summer, or it's just underneath the soil. They are sh shade, part shade with sunny openings. They have deep fertile soils of years and years of leaves and plant parts and animal parts and whatever becoming part of the soil. They are layers, primary canopy, understory woody plants, herbaceous and bulbs, corms, tubers and rhizomes. The pH is acidic to neutral to alkaline, but we do have different types of acidic forests to alkaline forests. We have root competition. Trees win. They get nutrients, water first, then the shrubs, then the herbaceous. Vines and spring ephemerals are a huge part of these forests and sometimes autumnal ephemerals. The summer in the forest, very often you have more bare ground than you do in the spring and in the autumn. And the environment is modified by the plants. The trees direct the water by their canopies to their roots. They cool. You walk into a woodland, a forest, and it is immediately cooler than outside. Garden correlates of this are shade gardens, rock gardens, stormwater control gardens, rain garden, bioswale, wildlife, and forest gardens. By the way, all this is on the handout. So I hope you are not furiously scribbling this down. This is a natural forest, Peanut Falls on the Hudson River. And you can see, this is in October. You can see the rocky outcroppings. You can see the trees, how they negotiate around those rocks and grow anyways. And that plant that's still in leaf, that is not Amer honeysuckle, that is Chinese wisteria. And right now it is a huge threat up and down the woodlands of the, um, the Hudson River. So keep your eye out for that. And if your Chinese wisteria is spreading, um, please try to take the appropriate measure. This is a realized um, forest. This is the lower part of the rock garden in Innisfil Metro Park. Beautiful area. I spent a lot of time uh, at Innisfil in the 90s and early uh, aughts of the 2000s. And this forest is almost perfect, but there's one thing that doesn't belong and that's grass. Although you could call it the ground cover <laughs> and it is irrigated. So it is a forest, a woodland that is being helped out. Um, just think somebody has to come down and mow that little strip of grass, maintenance. I, the other thing or the part of this, and I'm not talking about maintenance of these systems, Again, that's a whole nother discussion, but I can't help when I look at gardens. Oh, that's a maintenance, maintenance issue. Mm, you know, if you just did this. So that is also in the back of my mind when I design and when I play in my own garden. This is a forest that was there and the homeowner decided that he wanted to put in more spring ephemerals and bring in some exotics that he liked as long as they weren't invasive. It's a beautiful garden. He has recently sold it and I have not been back to it since, um, since it's under new ownership. I'd be curious to know how it is now. David Jackie and Eric Toensmeyer wrote a two volume set called The Edible Forest Garden, another text that has been a strong influencer for me. David Jackie talks about using natural systems, using idea, uh, habitats, if you will, and even calls this a habitat bubble diagram. When you look at how you want to design an area. So here we have a yard and he defines the upper edge as the woodland edge garden an old field mosaic, and you'll see what that turns into in a moment. Old field mosaic means an old farm field or an old open area that may have been used, a human use, but is now returned back to a more of a natural system. 
aquatic gardens and strategic materials, which means your compost pile, your gravel, your whatever. As you look at what he's done and you look at the woodland edge garden, you can see scattered canopy and understory trees. Um, by the way, just quickly, uh, this is used by permission from Dave Jackie. Um, we talked via, via email and I said, can I use these? And he said, sure. Uh, I took a class with him in 2008, um, very dynamic speaker. If you ever have the chance to attend one of his classes, go, go, go. But um, he talks about that in the woodland edge, there will be for fruit, beauty, and insectary. So he's thinking about the others that come to our garden. Uh, for a windbreak, for screening, sunny spots, shady spots. The old field mosaic will be the outdoor rooms of edible herbs and vegetables. This is going to be the food garden aspect with shrubby mini fingers with many fingers of shrubs coming into there, um, many fruit trees, some insectary and soil builders. This is what we call paying attention to the ecology of a system as you design it. And this is one step further where he starts defining the trees. Already, There's already a Norway maple there, okay? You deal with it, it's there, you're not going to take it down. Oh, and I just have to give you a moment. The Cooper's Hawk is now sitting outside my window. Um, I guess she wants to hear what's going on too. <laughs> Sorry about that, but you can't ignore a hawk that's sitting right outside your window. Okay, back to the program. Um, you can see that old field mosaic area that is now the annual vegetable gardens and shrubs and the herb gardens, et cetera. Um, you can see that there's vehicle access to get to the strategic materials. There's a trellis that's going to have the kiwi fruit. So in here, there's a mix of native and non-native plants. I am, I am truly on the native bandwagon. I think we need native plants in our gardens. And I wish to second Doug Tallamy on saying that 75%, 60 to 75%, get your natives in your garden. If you're a fruit grower and herb grower like I am, I do have a lot of non-natives because if I were to have to depend on native plants for my um, spring, summer and fall food gardens, I'd be really hungry. So if you're interested in looking at this, this is an Edible uh, Forest Gardens Volume 2. Very good books. On to the prairie meadow. Sun, 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 sun. Prairies want sun. Prairie plants want sun. When I see prairie plants being put in the shade, I think, well, they'll grow, but they won't flower and they won't offer the services that our insects need. Prairies can be dry, wet, and or messic, which means in the middle. Shallow to deep fertile soils renewed annually by herb herbaceous plant litter because it's mostly her, it is herbaceous plants. You may have shrubs and trees on the edges, but our prairies are herbaceous systems and deep herbaceous systems at that. The layers are grasses, forbs, and bulbs, corms, tubers, and rhizomes, all pHs from acidic to alkaline. Root competition is different in this system. It's more vertical. Whereas in forest, you have a more horizontal system a more uh, with trees going horizontally um, dense grass roots and deeply diffuse open forb roots and growth is often modified by fire so if you have a prairie in your yard you probably won't be doing fire instead you'll be mowing garden correlates correlates of, of uh, prairies are wildflower perennial garden, herb garden, mixed garden, cottage gardens, green roofs, wildlife gardens, stormwater control designs, and food gardens can be likened to a prairie or a meadow. By the way, a prairie, a lot of people define, I, it took me a while to understand why, but many people define a prairie as having more grasses to forbs, forbs being flowering plants, and a meadow is defined as having more forbs than grasses. 
But I will tell you that prairie is the French word for meadow. Uh, so do with that what you will. Root systems of prairie plants. Take a look. Look at those grasses. Here's a grass here, the Indian grass. Here is um, switchgrass, Panicum brigatum. Take a look at compass plant all the way down to almost 16 feet in the soil, long deep roots to get between those grasses. And the little uh, blazing star, look at that, even deeper. I'd like to draw your attention over to the left. See this little tiny thing right here? Right here. That is Poa pretensis, Kentucky bluegrass, with its uh, roots about two to three inches into the soil. And we wonder why it dies in the summer when it gets hot and we don't get rain if we don't water. Instead, why not put these in the lawn, put these forbs and grasses and maybe have little strips of lawn in between because, um, because truthfully, I don't water my lawn. Well, you'll see why later, but I don't water my lawn. If it goes dormant, it goes dormant. These, um, these plants draw water and nutrients from deep in the soil. And that's why they're able to survive in case you ever wondered. This is Bigelow Prairie, a prairie remnant in Irwin, Ohio. It is open to the public. It is fantastic. And here in this prairie, you not only get the sights and the smells of prairie and, and, and feeling the plants, but you also get the sound. The sound of wind going through the grasses is just incredible. And here um, you have big blue stem and you have prairie dog and you have goldenrod. Speaking of goldenrod, Doug Tallamy mentioned uh, keystone plants. And so I was really happy that he mentioned goldenrod because it's one of my favorite plants in the late summer. And for some reason, goldenrod has a bad rap. I, I please put this to rest. You do not get hay fever from goldenrod. The pollen is too big, it's too sticky, and it is, it is moved from plant to plant by insects. The wind does not blow it, it can't. It's stuck there until an insect comes and get it, gets it. You are suffering from ragweed and possibly tree pollens if anything's in bloom from that and they're wind pollinated. So put that to rest. So here we have Riddell's goldenrod. I know that you may have Canada goldenrod, get that out of there, that's not good. Dig it out, that's what I've done. And after two or three years, it's gone. Use the other ones. We have so many beautiful goldenrods and there is a, a book, uh, Goldenrods of Northeast Ohio, a field guide to identification and natural history that you can, um, you can buy. It, it works for all of us here in Ohio and for a good part of the Midwest. But Ohio's goldenrod, Riddell's goldenrod, um, blue wreath, zigzag, uh, there's lots. And a lot of them are clump formers and don't self seed like a son of a gun. Um, be careful with Saladego um, speciosa, the showy one. That one takes over the world. But back to this, look at all the insects that benefit and birds because they come down and swoop up and eat the insects and birds that come to this plant. And I meant to ask Denise, I was going to send this slide to her to make sure that the little bee in the circle, I believe it is a longhorn bee, which is a specialist on goldenrod. It has to have this plant. There are generalists and specialists. Uh, you can see the bumble just above the, um, the circle and that's a generalist, she'll go anywhere. By the way, Another thing I'd like to discuss is that when you see bees gathering on plants, those are she's, not he's. They're back at wherever, you know, smoking a cigarette. It's the women who are doing the work here. All right, put that one to rest too. Also soldier beetles, the out of focus soldier beetles on the left, butterflies, skippers, moths, wasps, flies. This plant is amazing. Not only that, it is herbal, and it is edible by us. So what more can you ask from a plant? Plant goldenrod. 
Here is a prairie of sorts at the Heritage Garden at the Ohio Governor's Residence. This is the Oak Openings Dunes. And I showed you a picture of that earlier and mentioned that the sand can go down to 16 feet. In our garden here, it, this is only about five feet deep, five, six feet deep at its highest. I suspect some of these plants are putting their roots into the clay soils below, especially the um, butterfly weed, and getting a lot of nutrients because they are really hardy. They're great. And this is a plant that I absolutely love. And when I understood what it needed, I understood why it didn't grow in my clay soils in my garden. This is not a plant that I'm going to get to grow in the, the ecosystem of my garden. And this is sweet fern. Comptonia peregrina, an herb. This is a prairie that cleans water. This building, the um, um, Alberici Construction Company, I don't know their full name, but lead platinum. All of the water that comes off of their building and all of their hardscape sites goes into this prairie. It, it is a messic to wet prairie and it is filtered. Another prairie, if you will, extensive sedums on one side, intensive grasses and prairie plants on the other. And this is on the roof of the Pittsburgh Convention Center and one of, one of the prime places to gather for after work um, drinks and conversation pre-COVID. This is my low meadow. This is my lawn. And I am pleased that it is filled with all kinds of different weeds. What, what you see uh, are violets and dandelions in April. And um, I have to be vigilant because you'll notice there's a shadow of a tree. And the birds are kind and give me all kinds of seedlings here. Late, um, lately, calorie pear, quite a bit of that. And also aim your honeysuckle. Um, violets are edible by us. They're herbal. They're also important for many of our fritillary butterfly species. Aquatic wetland, lakes, rivers, swamps, etc. These are saturated hydric soils, which may or may not be visible to you on the surface. They're low oxygen soils, often um, um, anaerobic, and they're nature's kidneys. They clean the water, the waters of our world. There's seasonal fluctuations of the water. Swamps have more shade, marshes more sun, others vary. They're acidic to alkaline. Bogs are acidic, fens are alkaline. The plants are in it that are in it are obligate to facultative to marginal. Obligate means they have to have wet feet. Facultative means that would be nice. And marginal means they're on the edges and often in combination with edge ecosystems, and I'll mention that, show you that in a moment, many garden correlates, bog gardens, water gardens, etc. So here we have the edge of the Olentangy and the beavers have been busy taking, taking down the Ohio buckeye trees. You can see our trout, native trout lily coming up and right in here, you can see garlic mustard. There are groups of people who come and routinely clear these areas out of garlic mustard and chop down and um, try to get rid of the aim or honeysuckle. This is the cedar bog again, and here the skunk cabbage is done blooming and the marshmallow goats, marsh marigolds are just starting. This is a private residence. They have a vernal pool in the Little Darby, Cree, uh, Little Darby Creek watershed. This is a really special place. The soil can be as hard as rock in the summer, though. This is the bog garden at the Ohio governor's residence. You can see those are cranberries in bloom, cranberries in bloom, along with the flowers of our native orchid, the bog orchid, and our native uh, Saracenia um, pitcher plant, which, by the way, those go over winter outside if you have the right conditions. You cannot water them with tap water. This is a bio basin at New Albany High School. And the water from their uh, parking lots and other hard surfaces are directed into this bio basin and kept on site. 
This is the rain garden along the building of the Alberici headquarters, a bioswale. And the water that comes directly off the sidewalks is then pumped into that prairie that I showed you earlier. Rain gardens and prairies are beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Sometimes it takes a shift in what we call beauty. And finally, the edges. The boundary between two ecosystems or habitats. Greater biodiversity happens here, and it's where invasive plants tend to invade first because of the nature of that habitat. The characteristics of the, hab of the edge depend on the two joined habitats. And it's happening more and more as we fragment ecosystems. Edges are good, but we're having too many of them. But take a look in your own gardens and you'll see the dynamic, uh, dynamic activities that happen on those edges between grass and garden etc. So um, the Olentangy wetlands is uh, off campus and it was a wetland just off of the Olentangy River. Then it was turned into farmland and now it's back into wetland again. It was a, a part of a mitigation project where somebody builds something on a wetland and then money has to go to create a wetland somewhere else. And Bill Mitch, uh, who was at Ohio State at that time, said, let's bring this back. And they did. And there are many edges between the water of the, uh, of the pools, the kidney pools, and then the marsh and um, the marsh edges and into an upland area that is dry. This is a riparian border along the edge of the Chesapeake Bay between the land and, and the water. These are all native plants that filter the water that goes into the bay. The Chesapeake Bay was dying and it is now living again. There's a bit of a problem though, because when you turn around, there's a mean, clean, green lawn behind it. And there are a lot of big houses on the Chesapeake Bay because it's a great place to live. It's really gorgeous. So fortunately, these plants, there's enough of a border here to filter out the chemicals that are put on this lawn to keep it that way. I was on a tour, um, a PPA Garden Calm tour, and we asked what was used to keep the lawn looking like this. And the homeowner was not there, but the caretaker told us that yes, they use conventional chemicals on this lawn. So why would you do that if you're on the edge of the Chesapeake Bay? I'll let you think about that. And also at the Chesapeake Bay, they use a lot of dry river beds, uh, very decorative, to take water from different areas of, of, of people's um, yards and take it down to the Chesapeake Bay in a slow manner, because what this does is slow the water that goes down. So I'm going to propose that same thought that I said earlier in the talk. Are you working with understanding what you have or are you changing your place to create what you want? And the answer to that is probably both. You can think about it some more, but as gardeners, we are creators and we are destroyers. We do both. Um, the important part of that is that what we create puts back or gives back to what we destroyed. Because sometimes if we build a house <laughs> or we change something significant, this is what we're left with. Um, these were clients of mine and they wanted gardens we did get the gardens close to the house in. I'm not sure what they did afterwards. Um, but they wanted, um, they said, what, what can we do in this area around the house? And I said, well, first we need to start spreading some uh, compost and put in a cover crop. And, and the response was, that's not pretty. And I said, well, these soils, we have to break up these soils to make something work. Well, can't we just spread some topsoil? and put grass seed down. 
And you saw poet pretensis in the short, um, the short root system. And sure, we could use we could use some of the rise and the fescues. They go deeper, uh, fescues especially. But you have to be able, they have to be able to get the roots there in the first place. And there were actual tractor marks, you know, from on um, there. So you just know that that soil is damaged. So these are questions that you have to ask if you are repairing something that's really been impacted by development, by building. So I'd like to leave you with this last thought. And what you're looking at is a part of my backyard and that's a black walnut and I love black walnuts. Yes, I know, big, huge nuts that the squirrels bury everywhere and you get black walnuts. But there's pawpaws and there's spice bush and there's also hellebores, which I love. And there's native ferns and there, there's so many different things in this area. But nature has been my greatest teacher sitting there. And I do that more now, I take more breaks when I work in the garden. But I sit there and I look at what she's trying to tell me. And if I listen, I do the right thing. Because our greatest problems result from the difference between how people think and how nature works. Thank you for listening. Great, thanks Deb so much for a wonderful session. We have a lot of really great questions. I'm gonna ask you to start with one that came up a, a couple of times. Uh, can you talk about, um, clarify the bad goldenrod, uh, maybe a favorite goldenrod and whether you should you take out a goldenrod that you already have? Um, the only quote unquote bad, you know, it's really bad to call a plant or animal bad. Um, I should really not do that. That's one of those, those things I should change, but I don't know if I ever will. I think Canada thistle is bad. Circium arvents. Oh my gosh. Um, because it self seeds like a son of a gun and it also sends out rhizomes. So it's sending out rhizomes and it's popping up everywhere. So to me in a small garden, that is not going to work. Now, if it's a huge open area and Canada um, thistle is there and it's a native area, people aren't going to go in and take that out. But in our gardens, we don't have room for it. So it's a plant that has a place, just not in our garden. So some of the good goldenrods, if you will. Um, um, I said Circeo, I meant Solidago, um, Solidago canadense. I was thinking of Canada thistle, that Circeum arvense. I apologize. Those sometimes those words, I'm thinking fast and talking fast and I need to slow down. <laughs> so so um, Canada goldenrod is Solidago canadense. You want uh, Solidago uh, cesia, which is the blue wreath. You want um, uh, Solidago Ohio ohioensis, the Ohio goldenrod. Riddell, Riddellii, you want zigzag. And right now zigzag is just not coming into my head what the species name is, but I do have this book and I mentioned it, the golden rods of Ohio, of Northeast Ohio, but it, it goes for all of us. And there are, it's excellent information. <clears throat> it won't tell you how to plant it. It will tell you what it is for this particular book. Um, where do you buy these plants? We have so many native nurseries that are popping up in Ohio and they're good ones. And go to your garden centers and ask them for native plants. And if they don't have them, then go find one that does. There is an excellent resource on the website, uh, Nancy Linz's website, Ohio Native Plant Month. And um, she put together a resource list where you can buy native plants. Also on there is a chart that Hope Taft and I worked on, on native plants. It is on, I don't know, Nancy was going to try to get it onto eight and a half by 11, but I think it, my version is on eight and a half by 14 because I just didn't have enough room. And it has all kinds of native plants with their insect pollinators. Um, and it took us a long time to put that together. So 
if that's something that interests you, go take a look at that. Some of the um, solidagos, some of the goldenrods are on that. I hope that answers that. Great, thanks, Deb. There were several questions about um, invasives, invasive ground covers and other invasives, maybe just an approach to um, getting your hands around those literally and figuratively. Okay, so invasive, there is a, uh, there is a list of invasive plants on the Department of Agriculture's list. You can go to the department, DOA, Department of Agriculture, and, um, and, and get that list. And there's also a list on OIPC's site, that's the Ohio Invasive Plant Council. And you will see ground covers listed like winter creeper euonymus. And, um, oh gosh, uh, of course, it's none of it's coming to my brain right now, but how do you deal with them? Um, you pull them, you pull and you pull and you pull. And then when you get really, really frustrated, you might bring out the chemicals because there comes a point when um, you have to make the choice on whether or not you're going to use chemicals to kick something back. I have pulled on winter creeper euonymus in my backyard in the way back for almost 30 years. And that's when I realized that it was a problem <laughs> and it keeps coming back. And so um, last year, well, two years ago, I did use Roundup on it and uh, was very careful and then started pulling again last year, uh, the two years after, because now it's at a point where I can get most of it out of there. Before I couldn't, I just could, couldn't. Um, for the most part with invasives, I like to use non-nuking strategies, but, uh, and that is mechanical, your two hands or somebody else's two hands. Okay, thanks folks. We are at about the 60 minute spot. So if you have to hop off, uh, we understand, but maybe you can offer Deb uh, thank you in the chat box. I see lots of you have already done that. And then we'll keep answering questions. We will record this and post uh, the, the Q&A portion as well. Um, Deb, there are a lot of questions about, um, the, the question was specifically about how to find um, landscaping services in Ohio, but I think if we broaden that question, since our audience is from um, all over, mm -hmm. how do we find those um, designers, landscapers, nurseries who can help us uh, bring this kind of ethic and these ideas into our own landscape? And it, it's a similar question, uh, a similar answer to how do you find native plants? You talk to other people who have gardens like what you want. When you go to a garden center that has those native plants, you say, do you know anyone who does this? Who, um, who designs like this? Uh, you go to webinars like this and you, um, you ask that question and hopefully someone in the chat box will say, hey, I'm a, um, I'm a designer of, of ecological gardens or of water gardens that use native plants or or prairie gardens that use native plants. There are many, and I really hesitate to say names uh, on, on this because um, you always leave someone out and then you hurt their feelings. But I ask around, I'm constantly asking, um, you know, and, and watching, you know, who's doing this? Or if I see a design that I like, I think I go and ask, who did this? You know, and, and then go from there. So it takes a little bit of research on your part but it comes with those questions, you know, and, and then the companies too, you know, when you, when you go with a company to take care of your, um, your lawn, I, I use organics on my lawn, composted chicken manure, granulated composted chicken manure, and distilled brewery grains uh, to keep down quote unquote weeds. Although I don't know that I use that at, uh, need that as much. It makes the violets grow great. <laughs> so, um, but it decreases weed seed. Uh, but I asked around to try to find out who does natural organic controls and make sure you make sure what they're using, because there have been times when I've seen natural on a truck 
and it's not natural what they're spraying. It's synthetic, a synthetic input. I know where you are in central Ohio, honeysuckle is a big deal, a real invasive <laughs> problem. Um, so uh, Robert asks how, um, how to remove those, maybe a recommendation for a best way to approach that and what native plant do you might recommend to put in its place? <sighs> okay. When they're small, they're easy to take out. And when they're middling, you know, in their first five years of life, you can you can pull them out or you can use. There are um, there's there's actually a, a honeysuckle pole. It's a big, excuse me, and you can take out pretty big honeysuckles. But you you put it down into the ground and and it lifts the roots of the honeysuckles. For the ones that are really big and established, I know the chemical control is used. I have a friend who um, is bringing back his 28 acres of forest, uh, so many invasives in it. And what he does is he cuts and he paints with um, a chemical that stops the growth of Amir honeysuckle and autumn olive and um, oriental bittersweet. So depending on the size of the plant, you can pull by hand with the, with the uh, mechanical pull or using chemicals. Um, substitutes, now that there's something, that, what a great question for that. Substitutes, our choke berries are great for that. The uh, black choke berry and the red choke berry. Um, I'm trying to think if there's an article I can direct you to. I wrote an article for a couple publications, but I'm not sure that they're accessible. But but that is something that um, would be a good talk for Denise of uh, good alternatives for invasives. Um, so the black and red chokeberry, excellent plants and also excellent for insects uh, and birds, etc. <clears throat> if you're in shadier areas, I can't recommend enough the spice bush. Lindera benzoin. There's also our nine barks. And uh, I, it was a revelation to me when Doug Tallamy said that the red ones, which I love so much because I love the color, are not as good, <laughs> good for <laughs> larva because of the anthocyanins. I thought, oh, well, shoot. Okay, so I'll go out and plant a few green ones uh, because all of mine are red. <laughs> so I'll have to fix that. Um, spirea, we have some native spireas that you can use in place of Amir honeysuckle. There's also, um, you know, I'm thinking in my yard, depending on whether you have deer or not, if you do not have deer, clethra is wonderful. Clethra is summer sweet. And if you have a wetter area, there is Itea virginica, the um, sweet spire, Virginia sweet spire. I think in botanical names, folks, sorry, that comes first. Uh, I have to work at common names for plants. Um, let's see, there are also, there are some evergreens. Uh, it depends, those are native plants that I've been mentioning. I'm trying to think of evergreens that would work. Um, it would depend on your soils, but there are also the broadleaf evergreens like azaleas. And if you are fortunate enough to have acidic soil, there are the calvias, the, um, what is the common name for Calmia? Mountain Laurel. Thank you, Mountain Laurel. It is so nice to have you on this call, Denise. Um, <laughs> so, um, and, and what you need to do, and, and what I've mentioned is mostly for Ohio and the Midwest, if you are from other places than that, please go to your extension offices. I'm sure somebody has put out a list of plants to, um, to use in place of invasives. Uh, there are lists like that. What you need to do is make sure that they're good for your environment, your soils. Okay, Deb, okay. Can Candace has a tree lawn that she'd like to take out. She's looking for a native replacement, um, but it can't get more than 18 inches high uh, because of visibility in the turn lane. Yep, <clears throat> yep. Um, Oh, let's see, I would imagine it's sunny for the most part. So there's there was a whole movement in Denver, Colorado. Not that these Denver plants will work for you, but it, it it's this idea. And they called it redoing your hell strip. You know, that 
that strip of land between the street and the sidewalk that you wonder what to do with and you're so tired of mowing it and, and watering it or making it look good. So that, that keeping that in the back of your mind, uh, native plants that are low, I don't know if you're looking for herbaceous or shrubs, but lately there have been some low shrubs that have been coming out. There's a low aronia. I have to see if it stays under 18 inches. That's the chokeberry, by the way. Uh, a low black chokeberry uh, called um, um, low scape mound, low scape mound. And there are a lot of very short shrubs that are coming out. There are some very short potentillas. So that's a shrubby and that that is native. <clears throat> In terms of herbaceous plants, you know, I'd, I'd have to sit down and think about it, but we do have low um, purple cone flower. There are some low, low monardas, uh, bee balms that are only supposed to get 12 to 18 inches. And they were expressly designed to stay in that, that height. And what you can do is maybe plants that might get all the way up to 18 inches, keep those to the middle of the lawn in the center area of the lawn and then have low ground covers outside. Um, I'm just totally blanking on low sun ground covers. All I'm thinking of are all shade ground covers um, that are native. One, um, one that I like, it's not native, <laughs> is thyme. I love thyme in a garden. And while it's not native, it does offer services in May to a lot of bees. <clears throat> I don't know about the quality of the pollen. I hope someday someone looks at that. But the times are fantastic in, in what we call the hell strip. And I'll have to think more about uh, lower plants for sun and for that area. Thanks, Deb. So uh, we all get uh, kind of stuck. We want to do this in our own gardens, but how do we get this further than just the, the choir, so to speak? Mm -hmm. um, so Nancy's wondering, how do you um, present this approach to homeowners association or maybe other groups that you're trying to uh, convince to, to move toward this approach? I use their kids and their pets. So <laughs> I, I uh, unabashedly say, are your kids walking on that lawn? And what did you just put on it? And you have dogs? And have you ever watched your dog lick his paw or her paw? Same with cats. Um, so I use, I use pets. And in fact, and this is just a brief story. My granddaughter at the time, and, and she was in that picture um, early in the talk, planting seeds in the, in the box. She was about six years old. And there was a little white sign at one of our neighbor's yards and it had a skull and a crossbones on it. And she said, grandma, what's that? And I explained to her that they had put chemicals on the lawn that we couldn't step on the lawn because those chemicals could be dangerous to us. And she looked at me and her eyes got really wide. She said, but what about the dogs that everyone walks around here? That was her response. And I thought, that is my granddaughter. So. So that's how I start. I will often say it's not only the health of the earth, which is huge and not everyone can think that big, but it's the health of those who are near and dear to us. It is our children. It is that person who wants to walk bare feet in the grass because man, that feels good. So if whatever you put in the grass shouldn't be harmful. And then if you extend that, you think, and, and I explain what's in soil. Uh, I Honestly, I love soil. And I talk about the organisms and I talk about the American burying beetle, which is almost extinct because of what we put into our soils and that we've destroyed their habitat. And I talk about um, the, um, the, the plants that take up some of those those compounds and it gets into their pollen and then the honeybees use the honeybees folks use our native bees the bumblebees they're really attractive organisms um use them and say and then they eat that and they go back and take it to their hives and the hive fails or or their their young fail or it goes into you know into the food system 
that's how I approach it. I approach it that you're killing things. Um, I'm speaking to the choir here. I know that. Um, maybe I ticked a few of you off when I got into the lawn discussion, but, but to me, um, it's all about understanding that we live with a lot of others on this earth and we are part of those others and that we need to start respecting them. And that's my answer to that. Okay, thanks. Jane has yet to winter sow her natives um, and wonders if you have suggestions on how to proceed at this point. That is not, I do not know. And I know that I saw some names in the chat box. There are some folks here on the call that could answer that question much better than me. Um, and actually speaking I, to the chat box, someone shared a workshop at the Westerville Library and that link is, is back in the chat. Guys, you've done a great job of, of really populating the chat with great plant suggestions and websites and that sort of thing. And we'll leave the, um, We'll leave the room up for a little bit so you can go back in folks and scroll through the chat and pull out some of those links. But there was a webinar that Westerville is offering on sowing seeds in um, milk cartons, which a lot of folks are doing now. And I saw that and, and that's for that, but I got the impression she meant winter seeding outside. And uh, that's what that is. That okay, the, uh, okay. That's because that's the milk carton goes outside sort of like a little cold frame sort of thing. Right, yeah, but I thought she meant winter seeding her whole prairie, her area with seed. And, uh -huh. and that's what I was responding to. Um, but it is getting close because it is uh, the end of January. Pretty soon I'll be putting some of my seeds out of different fruits, vegetables, and annuals that I like to grow, flowering annuals. Um, but for winter seeding the prairie, I think we're coming to the end of the window of that. Um, although, I've heard of, of seeding into the beginning of February, but I don't know after that. That That is a question that would need some research on my part. Okay, thanks, Deb. Yeah. Um, so let's end with this question um, from okay. Deborah, uh, because you showed that beautiful picture of your lawn with all the diverse <laughs> flowers. And I can just imagine all the, the bees and um, others enjoying all those flowers. And so Deborah wonders, are all violets good? And are, are there any non-natives that uh, we should watch out for? To my knowledge, I mean, there are non-native violets. And if you look at the pansies that we grow, which I love so much, I love their sunny little faces. Um, the pansies, they're actually a hybrid. So technically, um, and I believe they're a hybrid of two non-natives. The ones that grow in our lawns, um, Viola sororia, I think, um, is native. And I'm saying that cautiously because I'm not positive. Um, it is edible. And to my knowledge, all viola flowers are edible for us. And I know, and, and I will mention that I have four different kind of flower colors in my violas scattered in my yard. Uh, one of them has freckles and they all taste different in salad. So I just thought I'd mention that. To my knowledge, I, there are no poisonous viola flowers. And you can also eat the pansies that you buy, although I'd be careful because you don't know what chemicals were used on those pansies in the nursery. So I usually stick to my lawn violas because I don't use anything that is harmful to them. Okay. Thanks, Deb. And thanks for a wonderful session. Um, folks, thanks for your input and your questions and for all the thanks that you've put in for Deb. I know we um, it was really a um, um, just filled us up, I think, with some wonderful ideas and thoughts and suggestions for plants and books. Um, really appreciate your time and expertise. Well, thank you for letting me talk about something that's really important to me. And go garden. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Um, look for the recording, um, hopefully later today. And um, hope to see you next Saturday with uh, with Rick Dark. Okay. Bye. Thanks, everybody.